Professor Henry Daniel, whom I know for decades. It's exciting to see Henry is here. He's right now from University of Pennsylvania, US, and he will be talking on advance in chloroplast genomes and biotechnology. Henry. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Rajiv. Thank you, Swapan. It's always wonderful to uh, wonderful uh, to see Swapan and Rajiv and all friends. <laughs> it's uh, the highlights uh, of uh, going to these uh, conferences, and uh, it's a pretty impressive uh, program. So my talk is going to be truly interdisciplinary, starting with plant genome and how modification of the plant genome could help uh, deficiencies in human genome. And uh, so it's uh, for, for students in the U.S., uh, we emphasize on the interdisciplinary approach because most problems are so complex that that requires multidisciplinary uh, approaches. So why um, chloroplast? Can I use? Okay, the keyboard doesn't. This be. And on. <laughs> oh, yeah, it is. Yeah. So um, we focus on chloroplast genome. Obviously, uh, you will hear a lot more uh, of uh, nuclear genome. And the rationale uh, for this is that there are um, 50 to 100 chloroplasts per cell, 100 genome per chloroplast. So there are 10,000 copies of uh, chloroplast genomes uh, per cell. Uh, this translates into high-level gene expression because you could put 10,000 copies of foreign genes into the chloroplast genome. The other added-on advantage is maternal inheritance of the chloroplast genomes. And therefore, especially if the gene um, say if you put an insulin gene to make larger quantities of insulin, you don't want these genes uh, cross-contaminated with other plants. So the chloroplast genomes are maternally inherited. So two key advantages of the, uh, the uh, chloroplast genome is the rationale behind advancing this. From a genomics perspective, um, the first chloroplast genome tobacco was sequenced in 1986. So till 2004, only six other chloroplast genomes were sequenced, largely because of the misconception that when you sequence one chloroplast genome, they're all the same. But half of the chloroplast genome, uh, the intergenic space region is not conserved. In grass chloroplast genomes, not even a single intergenic space genome is conserved. So half of the chloroplast genome is not conserved. So we started this big emphasis on sequencing important uh, crops, including soybean and potato, tomato, uh, things that we uh, are used in everyday life. And that initiated uh, a big m moment in this field now we have over 800 chloroplast genome sequence. Of course, only uh, 65 of them are crop species. All the others are done for evolutionary purposes. So step one is knowing the genome. And step two is then integrating the foreign uh, cassette into the um, genome. And uh, this is done in a very simple manner. Insert the foreign genes into the intergenic space region. And um, once you integrate, um, 
This is done by homologous recombination. Essentially, take two genes, insert the gene with the selectable marker in it, and then by double homologous recombination, uh, they get into site-specific manner uh, inserted into the chloroplast genome. Uh, interestingly enough, this method is, uh, this is exempted from USDA APHIS regulations because we do not use any um, plant pathogen. We do not, we use for regulatory regions chloroplast. So it's all native uh, sequences. The foreign DNA is not inserted using any of the pathogenic uh, approaches. The simple method, we coat these cassettes, plasmids on gold particles, we shoot them in, and this, these flanking sequences and regulatory sequences are highly uh, site-specific. Mm. You, if you take tobacco and insert the letters or vice versa, uh, every single nucleotide variation in the intergenic region will be modified to make it 100% homologous. So that's why you have to have species-specific vectors. If you use tobacco chloroplast promoter in lettuce, the transcription translation is down by 90%. So many of these basic concepts uh, were helpful in developing um, useful uh, applications using this concept, in this case, lettuce. Um, once you modify one cell, you need to change all of the 10,000 copies. So this is done by second or third round of selection. So ultimately, what we call as homoplasmy. There is no evidence by PCR that the native genome. So this is done very simply by putting the PCR primers on the flanking genes to see whether there is any native gene product there. And once we have this, um, I, even though I summarize all these things, um, in, uh, in three, four slides, it, you can see that from, from the beginning to uh, get to the herbicide resistance, this was Monsanto's uh, herbicide resistant gene. It almost took uh, 10 years because uh, it was a pioneering um, field and we have to develop all basic concepts. So the reason why this was featured in Nature Biotech was because for the first time we showed that the herbicide resistant gene EPSP synthesis gene could be maternally inherited, and uh, sometimes the, flow, the flow of transgene through pollen, uh, I'm not saying it is a problem, but when it becomes a problem, uh, this um, uh, chloroplast transformation is helpful. The other advantage is that the high level of expression, you can see here in the Kumasi stain gel, so we can see protein in Kumasi stain gels. If you see the lower um, arrow here, um, that's insulin and that is rubisco. Oops. Um, so you. You could see that the bottom arrow uh, is insulin, so the production can be as high as rubisco and uh, the the electron micrograph you see is BT crystals. This is almost 50% of the leaf protein is BT. You don't need that much, but the demonstration would be that for cotton bollworm, you can see uh, um, the panel F, the insect takes a single bite and dies. So that's all the insect can, can, can survive. So this protects insects from developing resistance. So these are some of the dramatic illustrations how uh, um, hyper high level expression um, can can be very helpful, and uh, so that again was featured in uh, cover of Nature Biotech. It was kind of a pun, clear as a crystal, uh, was um, to show that chloroplast transformation can really do high level expression. Um, moving ahead, ten years. This is last year. We showed that the the BT crystal was done with a chaperone in a BT operon. In this case, we have expressed 14 genes to produce artemisinin. So um, the field is quite rapidly advancing, and more recently, we have made the whole genome synthetic so that we can introduce entire desired pathways. So synthetic biology and uh, chloroplast engineering are quite uh, effective. But that I should also tell you what didn't happen in the field, even though we demonstrated carrot which can go on 400 millimolar sodium chlorate, essentially seawater. Bayer worked with us 
and they develop soybean herbicide resistance and insect resistance, but it was not advanced to the market. They did clinical trials in Brazil, but they did not, largely because these traits have already been successfully accomplished through nuclear transformation, and therefore there was no room for another new technology. No matter how much we try to convince the agencies, even Bayer shelved this project. Now that they have bought, they are buying or bought Monsanto, maybe it might change, but at that time there also were IP um, um, issues and uh, other matters. So what has advanced to the, uh, the production line is what I'm going to show for the rest of the presentation. Um, again, all of this ba is based on high levels of expression. For example, producing enzymes uh, for industrial applications, paper, pulp industry, uh, coffee, or any of these things, nuclear expression hasn't been adequate, but chloroplast has been quite successful. So um, almost uh, seven years ago, we showed that we can hydrolyze um, pine wood. So we can make enzyme cocktails, and individual enzymes made in dried powder, plant powder, as cocktails. And this is now um, advanced to the clinic at the commercial production level uh, for various applications, from detergent to pulp to coffee and so on. So this is moving on. Um, again, uh, using different biomass. There is no successful cellulosic ethanol facility yet, but this is one among the last man standing where these plants using this high level production is now um, uh, moving, um, uh, moving to that. One of the test sites are in India, done with ICT uh, in Mumbai. And um, so the rest of the uh, applications, successful applications that are going to human clinical trials are to fix deficiencies in the human genome and uh, from health perspective. And these have been extraordinarily successful with multi-million dollar investment by pharmaceutical companies. So the rationale for doing this is that you take insulin, which has been out of 50 years ago, Till today, 90% of the global diabetic population cannot afford insulin. If you can see the top uh, 10 drugs, the GDP is more than three-fourths of the GDP. Most of those countries cannot afford biopharmaceuticals. There are generic, generic drugs for small molecules, like artemisinin is relatively less expensive, but not insulin, but not clotting factor for hemophilia, for angiotensin, for cardio, um, cardiac treatment, and so on. So, um, yeah. number two is that all these 50 years, the protein is made in yeast or E. coli or Cho cells. They're purified and injected. So there is no other drug delivery method um, other than purifying an injection. When you purify it, then um, it has short shelf life. It has to be stored. So. Our lab is committed to developing a simple drug delivery method which would reduce the cost. And, uh, and um, I'm also a professor in the dental school, so we have also developed drugs using chewing gums uh, for oral um, have, um, to kill bacteria that hide under the plaque. So, so the rationale uh, for this um, is that the current fermentation facility, no matter what cell culture you use, they are $500, $900 million, and then you need to purify them, inject them, all these add to the cost. But the concept that I proposed was produce them in large quantities in plant cells, dry them, package them, you can give them as, as uh, um, orally, and I <laughs> Yeah, you can reduce the volume and uh, so can you play the video please? So um, so once we produce lettuce, this facility is uh, Fraunhofer is near uh, our lab. So uh, we give the seeds, robots um, sow them and then they are all um, hydroponically grown. So this is a FDA approved facility. And once these uh, uh, robots move um, these trays around, they are automatically harvested, and you collect the biomass. 
And uh, so you will see the last step. You will see the, um, the, the tray that's being flipped and the leaves are harvested. So that is the pharmaceutical final product. So from once you get the biomass, you go to the, the next step is to uh, put them in a lyophilizer so they are freeze-dried. Essentially, it's a freeze-drying process, but a very sophisticated freeze-drying process where protein folding, disulfide bonds, and everything is maintained, and the insulin is fully functional. So after this, you can um, it's dried, and the dosage is determined at the capsule level. The FDA doesn't require, because when you grow plants, you cannot assure that they all produce the same amount of protein, and that's not needed. The dosage is determined at the uh, capsule level. So once they are there, FDA's requirements are that, can you show that this protein is stable uh, at whatever temper room temperature, because we are claiming that this eliminates a cold chain. So if you see here, this is human blood clotting factor. If you see the right side panel, it's a large protein, 250 kilodalton protein, blood clotting factor nine, forming a pentamer with disulfide bonds and everything. It's stable for three years. Two years, recently we have published that in up to three years. So absolutely stable at room temperature. These capsules can be shipped anywhere in the world. And so truly um, met one of the major challenges. Currently there is no protein drug delivery method which can accomplish this. So this is step number one. The step number two is FDA knows how to do the drug quantitation in a purified format. If it is insulin, you use ELISA to quantify that. But you have to develop purification, I mean, in plant or drug quantitation. So we developed in, uh, this is no notice funded project, where they also had very high protein um, production characterization facilities. So we use mass spec. We can literally count the number of peptides. So we digest the peptides, and we have shown that this is uh, very, very um, uh, accurate compared to the, uh, the license. So FDA likes this method as well. So quite a lot of these things, one of the uh, fun things about doing science is that publishing in medical journal, and then all these are putting them on their covers and then really um, showing uh, the, the, the importance of this concept. One more challenge that we have to face in expression is that chloroplast prokaryotic. If you take a gene and put it in the human gene, and they don't express well. They express BT because that's bacteria. They don't do that. So in this case, we developed a software. So this software, this is based on over uh, several hundred genomes that are sequenced. We took the highest expression gene, PSBA, and found how the codon hierarchy is made. So we developed a software based on this, and now, if we don't do that, you can see that the ribosome profiling, they are stall, and as you can see on the top. But if we quadron optimize the human clotting factor, then they run through ribosome really fast. So using all this technology, we can now produce the doses and the conditions that FDA approves uh, um, as being consistent methodology. And then the last uh, technology revolution here is that when you orally deliver, is the protein drug clotting factor insulin protected from acids and enzymes in the stomach? If you see here, the plant cell, this is demonstrated using GFP. The green fluorescent protein in plant cells is intact in the gut. That means it passed through the stomach. Right? the acids and enzymes, because the plant cell wall, humans do not code enzymes to break down the glycosidic bonds in the plant cell wall. And from that, we, uh, there is gut bacteria, especially those of us who are vegetarians, um, the Prevotella, okay, that's only one or two species that can do this, and we have a large accumulation of Prevotella. So that break down the plant cell wall. After that, the GFP is absorbed in the epithelial cell. So that's the whole concept. Protection by bioencapsulation in the stomach and then digestion by gut bacteria. But then how will they cross the gut epithelium is we developed a lot of different tags. 
So the tags help them cross the gut epithelium. So three different steps are accomplished uh, here. So that's the entire drug delivery concept. So a lot of applications, quite a lot have been advanced to the um, uh, clinic uh, from clotting factors to um, hypertension and all of this in the interest of time. I'll just give you a couple of examples here. One is that the, uh, you know, um, we have developed insulin before we worked with clotting factors. But we work, when we worked with no one noticed, they are not interested in producing cheap insulin. Even though they tell in the discussion that 90, we could only reach 10% of the global patient population, when I tell them use a cheaper technology, they say that's not a good business strategy. So, but what they can fund, and they are funding ad advanced technology, is taking the, um, the drug where they have problems. In this case, clotting factor, when it's injected to patients, they develop antibodies. When the antibodies become IgE, they get anaphylaxis. In this case, after eight injections, all the animals die. So there is no way for them to develop tolerance to the drug. So one of the things that reaching the clinic is developing tolerance. So as you can see, when we feed plant cells, the immune system get trained by developing low doses. And so this is one of the most successful things as we can see, these are beagle dogs, and these dogs are 20, 25 uh, kilograms. And in this case, uh, we sprinkle the lettuce powder um, on food and then put some bacon flavor. They love it. They just uh, um, um, enjoy it. And uh, as you can see, the dogs that didn't have the lettuce have this kind of flaxes. So we have to give Benadryl injection to save them. So, so this is one of the most uh, successful examples. I've done all the toxicology studies. This is FDA, under FDA filing, and so it's progressing towards development of this um, concept to prevent serious reactions to the current uh, drug. So that is moving forward. This is an example of insulin. We compare injection to the oral. And finally, the um, example of pulmonary hypertension, if you can play the video on the left and the right, you could see the pulmonary hypertension. Right now, most patients die in three months because the right ventricle, you can see it's, it's enlarged ventricle, but that's because of deficiency of angiotensin converting enzyme and angiotensin 17. So when we give them for six weeks, you can see how the right ventricle shrinks and then it pumps to normal capacity restoration. And this is also um, um, approved by the uh, NIH SMART program. It's gone through toxicology studies and so on. Okay, so, um, okay, let me finish this. I think that was the last example. Okay, so maybe I'll just um, do this in two minutes, uh, Sopan. Um, uh, the, from an from a oral health perspective, one of the major challenges is that the bacteria hide under the plaque and no matter how much um, antimicrobial you put in, they cannot get in. That's because these bacteria secrete very thick, the red is the extracellular matrix, the green is bacteria. So no matter what you apply to, you cannot kill the bacteria. That's why you, uh, people lose their teeth and gum disease and so on. So we have developed that antimicrobial peptide that prevents the formation of this is a single topical treatment. So the single topical treatment is done by putting this antimicrobial peptide in chewing gums, so you chew this, the, 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 it blocks the formation of the peptide. More importantly, for people who have already dealt with a lot of plaques, you can see that we couple this antimicrobial with the enzyme. The enzyme kind of chews up the antimicrobial, I mean the extracellular matrix, and then when you ha have even Listerine, it becomes more effective. Right now, Listerine is ineffective because it only kills the healthy bacteria. So we, as we can see, this is funded by Johnson Johnson. It's going to human clinical trials and hopefully reach the market. It may reach the market sooner than any other drug because under American regulations, plaque is considered cosmetic. So they really do not need FDA approval. And therefore, you may see chewing gums with the core plus engineer material very quickly. So we have all the single tooth model and so on. So um, put artificial saliva, these are tests that were done in the lab. 
So all of this cannot be successful with funding, so I thank all of the, uh, uh, the funding agencies and uh, thanks to all my lab collaborators. Thank you.